All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar, Memory Processing and Learning. Our presenter today is Dr. Lori Daniels, and my name is Samantha Young, and I'm a member of the training and support team here at Hawks Learning. We'll have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions into the Q&A as we go. And I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Thank you. So today I wanted to talk about uh, memory processes and learning, particularly as they relate um, to the classroom and student learning. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. All right, so first thing I want to look at is that we often talk about, at least colloquial, of memory as kind of being one thing. So we use terms, me too, <laughs> sort of as, you know, I remember or I forgot, sort of meaning that it's it's just something you either do or you don't, right? Uh, but it turns out that memory, there's a lot going on underneath the surface, or another way of saying is that memory is not a process, which includes starting from the beginning with information entering, right? The, so our encoding, being paying attention to, hearing, seeing information, and then also our ability to maintain those memories uh, in a temporary sort of short-term memory, and then of course put them somewhere a little bit more long-term for storage that we can then recall later if uh, if and when we, we want to. So basically there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So one of the things I wanted to talk to talk about today is some of those behind the scenes and then how they can be, how we could take advantage of what's going on behind the scenes to help um, utilize our memory in a better way. So this is one of my favorite studies. <laughs> At, uh, it, you can see here, this is the uh, penny. And in the original study, this is exactly what was given to uh, a sample of participants. And they were asked to identify which one of these was the real penny here. And as you look at them, you see that this instantly is a little bit harder than you might think at first, right? So I would say if you ask people, do you know what a penny looks like? They almost always are going to say yes and then kind of look at you strange for asking such a question. But when really put to the test, it turns out we may not know what the penny looks like as much as we uh, think we do here, right? Uh, so in the original experiment when this was asked, it turns out uh, not too surprisingly, many people could not accurately pick out what the penny is. I know you're still thinking what it is. <laughs> if you have a penny, you can look and see. Otherwise, you're supposed to kind of be in that state where you're like, oh boy, is which way is everything here? You know, some of these features are on the front or on the back, and you can see they change the way uh, president's facing. Is he facing to the right or to the left? And kind of all that. So when we're really pressed and to pick out the details, it turns out we don't do so well. So I'll tell you the answer is actually A. That is the what the real penny looks like. And like I said, it's really to kind of think about how, why is this so difficult, right? I think it's kind of surprising that it's so difficult in the sense that we see a penny a, a decent amount of times and we've had a lot of experience with them. So we should probably do better on this. It shouldn't be as difficult as it is. Now, some people have argued, I think fairly, that maybe we just don't look at pennies as much because we can identify them by the color or the shape differences. And so we haven't really studied a penny. So this isn't a fair um, test. That may be true. Uh, however, this appears to work as well for things that um, we do look at a lot. So for instance, what are cell phone apps, how they're organized, um, what are, you know, maybe desktop computer, how that's organized. If you're given a test on it, it turns out that we don't really know from memory what these things uh, look like. So like I said, even if it's not the penny, but what this is really telling us is that just kind of seeing things or even interacting with things in this kind of way is not enough to get it into memory in a way that we can later uh, be pretty sure that we're identifying it accurately. 
So this tells us is there's must be good, better, and best ways to rehearse information in order to be able to recall it later. So that brings me to the next point, which is we have a lot of ways or things that we think about that matter as far as memory are concerned, but if really put to the test, as we say, which ones matter the most or does one matter more than others? And if so, why? So a lot of these things on the list, um, not necessarily saying that they're bad and only one is good, but if you had to pick, and that's really what this is asking, what is the most? So we have some things here that are very commonly thought of as being uh, very important for memory. So intention and desire to learn, right? Wanting to remember, wanting to learn something, uh, paying close attention to it, learning in a way that matches uh, what might be considered a personal learning style, uh, the overall amount of time spent on something. And then the last choice here is what we have what we what you think about while studying something or trying to remember something right and like i said all of these are are good in the sense that they're they're helpful but it turns out that really only one of these is the most important and that some of these end up either not mattering at all or really being subsumed under the one that matters so i'm gonna let you tell you which one matters and then show you how we know this is the, the case so it turns out the last one is the one that is the most important. Without it, the other ones don't really matter as much, if at all. So it's really only when you look at what people are thinking about, do, do the rest of these tend to come into play, right? So I'm gonna show you how we, how we know this to be the case and then what we can do with this information. All right, so we know this through experiments that have tested various ways that people rehearse and try to learn information and have ultimately seen which ones end up being the best. And they kind of, I think, maybe one of the simplest ways of doing this in original experiments were to try to manipulate the ways people thought about uh, information coming in. So basically you can do this by asking different questions or probing questions to see. Here, so let me give you an example. Uh, we have what's called a shallow type of rehearsal or processing, which means you don't really have to think about the information that much. You can rely on what it looks like visually. And because of that, you don't ever have to go much further. So a question like this might ask, um, what it looks like. So are these words in the same typeface? Are they both uppercase, both lowercase, right? That kind of thing. And people in this study only had to answer yes or no. Yes, they're the same. No, they're not the same, right? Sim simple enough. And again, it's not meant to be that difficult, but it's meant to force you to look at them and not have to do much else after that. And in contrast, this sort of deeper processing forces you to think about the meaning, at least at the minimum, what something might mean. And so a question like, are these words synonyms, forces you in order to answer that, you have to think about both words and whether in fact they are or do mean the same thing, like car and automobile. And of course, sometimes you would see words that were not synonyms. They were, you know, car and Fox, something like that, right? Those are not the same. And so you would simply answer no. But in order to do it, whether yes or no, you have to actually think about what the words mean. So the basic test here is to see whether this matters. Does the type of question being asked force the type of processing that then is going to show up in how much people remember these words later, right? Now, in one group, because we want to vary something else here, in one group, they were just simply asked the question, right? Are these words the same in, in how they look? Are these words the same in meaning? But another group got a little extra, well, perhaps a little extra help, and that they were told that it was, in fact, is a memory test, and that they'd be asked what these words mean or to, to remember these words uh, after the experiment. So in this case, we call this... Uh, giving people an intent, right? So intentionally telling them you're going to have to remember this so that they can employ strategies if they desire, right? In order to remember these words later. So this is what we mean by someone wanting to learn something, someone wanting to remember. 
So they were given a hint that they should want to remember and then kind of do what they, uh, you know, a process that as uh, in, in light of that, having to remember it later. So ultimately we wanna see, does that matter, right? Does telling people that you have to remember something or, or telling them to try to remember something matter? And then compare it to, in addition to these different ways of processing information. Now, I already told you the answer before, but now you can see it in graphical form here, which one ends up being important. Yeah. All right, so this is just a, a, a version of their results where they're comparing a sort of deep processing. And in this particular case, they asked the subjects uh, whether the word sounded pleasant or was pleasant, was a pleasant sounding word to them, which is kind of interesting, but in order to decide whether something is pleasant, you do usually have to invoke what it means, right? What is, you know, the word flower is pleasant to you. You have to think about what a flower means, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, versus just looking to see if a word has an A or a Q in it. That would be more of a shallow, right, visual sort of processing. And what you can see here, these results are very interesting. One, the type of processing absolutely matters, right? So for our deep processing condition, those are the ones that are uh, remembering more later, right? So they're percent correct that they remember after the test is almost in the 70s, high 60s, 70s here, right? So they end up remembering 70% of the questions that were asked in this way, right? This, um, you know, are these synonyms? Is this word pleasant? So things like that, they end up remembering a whole bunch of those. On the other hand, when asked in a sort of shallow way, do these words in the same typeface? Does this have an A or a Q? You could see that the memory overall goes down. So they're really only remembering about in the 40% range. So if we compare about 70% correct to 40% correct, that is a, um, a very decent difference, right? You can imagine for a relatively simple task. So if you can get, I always say, if you can get big differences with a simple task, imagine what that means when you complicate things. The differences will probably just get bigger, if anything, right? The other thing is, so we see that the type of processing people are doing, whether it's this deeper processing versus shallow, tends to matter a lot. But in addition, we want, we're interested in whether someone's intent, whether they wanted to remember something mattered. And here you can see that, well, there's a very small difference between the dark bars and the kind of clear or lighter bars there. It turns out that they're not actually significant, meaning, no, really, there is no difference. So that the participants who knew that they had to remember later and therefore had an intent to try to remember did not do any better than the participants who had no idea and it was a surprise memory task for them. I think this is rather shocking because we tend to think, well, if I want to remember something, uh, that should help me to remember it. Like that the pure desire to remember or learn in this case should be helpful. And what this is showing is that at least the way this is tested, it is just not. So we're going to look and see why the intent doesn't matter, but instead the type of processing uh, takes the day here. <laughs> Okay, so the question is why doesn't process, why doesn't intent actually matter? And probably the simplest explanation for why intent doesn't matter is because it, even though you may have an intent to learn, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do or I want to say the, the best type of processing. So for instance, if someone had an, an exam coming up, they may really want to do well on the exam. They may really want to learn the material, but then they may, when studying, go about and do something that isn't very helpful for their memory. And in that case, if they're doing something that's not helpful, it doesn't really matter how much they intend, the processing isn't right for learning, right? Or for, for uh, learning and memory here. So unfortunately, wanting the intent, it does not force you to do uh, you know, kind of useful things for memory. And because of that, intent ends up not being a really big deal. Now, if these two were related, then it would matter, but it turns out it does not. Here we go. Sorry, I knew that was coming up. Right, so we can look at various things people do and take into account that I think when they're doing these, they have the intent, but are they doing the right type of processing or the right type of rehearsal? So for instance, we often, um, do highlighting. So we might highlight something when we're reading it. Again, by itself, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it is a rather superficial. It draws attention 
to, you know, adds yellow or pink highlights or whatever color uh, draws attention to the words, but it doesn't actually force you to do anything with that. So it, in the act of highlighting by itself is not really going to do anything more than shallow processing, right? More than just what does this look like, but it doesn't make you think about it. Now, sometimes people go back after they've highlighted and then think about it. That of course would be useful, but by itself, it, depends on that second step, right? Which is going back and thinking about it in a more uh, deep way. We look at things like flashcards, which can be useful, again, if done sort of in light of deep processing. So again, just kind of looking at them, probably not. Uh, making it a kind of where you have to retrieve the information. So having on one side an answer, the other side the, the question or the term to be defined and sort of forcing yourself to, to define it numerous times. Yeah, that's probably going to help because it's gonna make you have to think about it. On the other hand, just kind of looking at it, you know, said not, not so much, right? And you notice here you get to see why time itself isn't really, um, isn't gonna matter that much because if, and I know we've all had this experience where we spend a lot of time perhaps reading something and then realize later we have no idea what we read. <laughs> I've been there myself numerous times. So I, I think it's common to be like, oh, I was just reading for 20 minutes and I have no idea, right? In that case, obviously it's what you're thinking about. You're not thinking about the material, you're just kind of wrote reading it. And whether you do that for 20 or 40 or 60 or minutes, is really not going to matter. It's not going to work, right? You're not going to remember any of that. So time does, time is helpful, but only if you're using deep processing. That is only if you're really thinking about the material and then more time would be better, right? Uh, a couple other things you see here are examples of like, you know, someone just reads an argument from, you know, reads it in an essay or in a passage versus actually actively making a decision whether they think the argument is persuasive. Normally when you try to make that type of decision, you have to think about it a little bit more deeply. That's going to help your memory for sure. Uh, same thing as like kind of going back to the flashcards a little bit where we just kind of look at something, look at that definition uh, versus actually coming up with a way to apply it. The act of applying forces meaning which forces deep processing, all which then help memory. So again, you can kind of see that extra step of doing something with the information, invoking meaning. Uh, it doesn't, in some ways it doesn't really matter what you do with it, whether you decide, you know, do I like this? Do I not like it? Is it persuasive? Can I apply it? What's it? All those are kind of doing the same thing, which is forcing you to think about it in a, in a deeper way, which are all going to help your memory for it later. Now, why is this the case, right? Because I think sometimes a lot of this is like, why, why wouldn't, why would some of these things matter and some not? And uh, of course, we know from from cognition studies and memory that this is in fact what what we see happening. But then we have to go back and kind of. Uh, try to figure out what is going on in the brain and what is going on in memory processes that show us that some of these techniques are useful and others are not so useful, right? So what's the underlying process going on? And one current sort of idea about it, and of course this would just be a, a theory that fits the data, but one theory that fits the data is to think about memory as a set of connections to each other, sort of our spider web, I got our just web of connections here. So when you think about something, you end up connecting it to other things that you know, right? And in fact, we do experience this when we try to retrieve memories. You might feel like you're really close to it. You're like, oh, what's the name? What's the name? I'm really close. It starts with a what, right? So you're you're in the web and you're trying to locate that that particular memory, and you may remember things that surround it or about it, but you just can't get the name yet. We call it tip of the tongue phenomenon but you're very close, right? So what that tells us is that you're in there somewhere <laughs> and, and each thing you remember can get you closer or triggers another memory. So that's the benefit of having kind of these connections is that they can trigger each other. So if I think of one, that increases my odds of thinking of the other one. But that's only the case if they're actually connected. If they're not connected, 
then thinking of one isn't going to help you at all. So in this diagram, that's the C with the dashed line there, showing that there is actually, there could have been a connection, but there isn't, meaning you never really put the memory for Jones's Vietnam lecture and never thought about what that might mean for today's current political situation. So thinking of either of those separately is not going to launch the other memory because you never put it together in the first place, right? If you had, then yes, thinking about the current political situation might remind you of the Vietnam lecture and in the other direction as well. So as I was telling us is that really memory is about finding things later, right? So you could have memories, but if you can't get to them, if you can't find them, then they're really no good, right? They're no good for you. So we, when we think about how to put down memories, how to consolidate them, we really should be thinking of terms of how to get to them later in the sense that, a, like I said, a memory is only as good as that allows you to retrieve it. So another way of kind of a metaphor for this, there's a lot of memory metaphors, but I think probably the one that fits the best is um, a library, right? And so if you think of a library and why it works uh, and for finding books, assuming that in this case, the books were actually memories that you wanted to find, it works because it's organized. It works because you know Right, either a card catalog or there's something electronic that can tell you how to get to that particular book that you want to get to, which is the same as a connection, right? A direction on how to get there. And the closer we can get to that in our memories, the easier it is to to find these things. Imagine you um, you learned a lot, right? You heard a lot of things, and let's call them books here, and you threw them all in the corner, right? And then you walked away, that's fine. But then the next day you said, oh, I wanna, I wanna find that book and look at it again. And of course it's somewhere in a corner in a pile with all the other ones. And what is your chances of actually locating that book? Well, it's gonna it's probably not very good, right? And you may get to it, but it's gonna take a lot of time. You might even give up before you, before you get to it. So the idea here is that if it's, that these connections bring structure uh, to our memory so that we can actually go back and find them later. Now we're going to see, talk about later, like where do these, you know, how do you make a memory connection or how does your brain know, we should say in a sense, what to connect with what. Now we've already seen part of it is that we're telling our brain what to connect and we're telling it because we're saying, when I think about this, I also think about this. And by doing that, I'm linking them together. Right, and so we're, we're kind of directing, we're organizing our own memories, just like kind of putting them in the, the card catalog here. Another way we see this and, and can utilize it is in something that we call schematic knowledge. So schematic knowledge is really no, general world knowledge. It's basically a lot of connections you would have accumulated over your lifespan for what is normal in the world in your world, I guess, right? People could have different um, general world knowledge, but things like um, what's in a kitchen, right? So if I told you I have a refrigerator in my kitchen, you would not be surprised at all. And you'd be like, yeah, okay, so does everybody else, right? But that isn't true, not everybody does. Uh, but so, you know, why are you not surprised by this information or why do you find it, you know, not very interesting is because that's already what you expect. You already have an expectation or what we call schema for what goes in a kitchen and refrigerator is one of those items. Now I could pick something that's not normally found there and I say a couch. And if I say I have a couch in my kitchen, you're like, whoa, really? Oh, how does that work? Where do you put it? You know, things like that, you know, you're interested <laughs> because it's not what you would expect. It doesn't fit your schema. Now I'm picking on kitchens here, but we have schemas for basically everything, including ourselves, other people, all sorts of uh, real world events. And the part of the advantage of having these schemas that come from memory collection over time is that they really help us to uh, 
prepare for the world. So instead of waking up every day and having no idea what we're supposed to do <laughs> or how to, how to get somewhere, how to do, you know, how to make coffee, what do I do in the morning type thing, we immediately know, right? And that's really what our schemas are helping us do is not feel continually um, surprised by life, right? And, and they also help us a lot in learning is that we sort of naturally activate our schemas if, if given any clue. So if I, like I said, what's in a kitchen, I'm immediately activating your schema for a kitchen. It also helps us with uh, memory in the sense that normally if we forget something, especially details, we'll tend to use our schemas, um, even unknowingly tend to use those to kind of make the world a little bit more regular. So I may not remember being in your particular kitchen what I saw, I was only in there for a second, but if you ask me later, did I see a refrigerator? I'm probably gonna say, yes, I did. And then have a false, in a sense, memory of seeing it because I don't actually have that memory, but my schema tells me I do. And that in fact, there was a refrigerator in your kitchen and I do quote, remember it, right? Uh, so let's see how this plays out in kind of like in a more classroom setting where we're, but. All right, so this one is a lot of fun. Let's get another experiment. Um, this is something that was given to participants to read and they had to do two things with it. One, they had to rate how much it made sense. So how comprehensible is this paragraph? And then they also later, surprise, surprise, were given a memory test for it. And they had to identify, you know, in fact, was this in the paragraph you just read? Yes or no? So we could see how well they, they remember these things. And if you look at it, it is purposely made to be um, not that easy to understand, right? So it is a purposely vague. But what's really missing here is that you're missing the, the schema. There's no schema activation because you can't get a sense of what's really going on. So I'll just give you an example here. It says the procedure is actually quite simple, but again, it doesn't tell you what procedure. So you're thinking of multiple procedures in your mind as you're going through it. And then it starts to tell you some of the things you might do. You arrange items into groups. Um, a lot of things do that, right? One pile may be sufficient. If you have to go somewhere else due to a lack of facilities, that would be the next step. Otherwise, you're set. Then they tell you it's important not to overdo things. So as you start to read this, you're like, what? You guys said, what are they talking about, right? What are they talking about? So I've led to like, if mistakes could be expensive, well, it's hard to guess what they're talking about here. But when we, again, so you see it, no surprise that, like I said, when this was given to participants, they rated this uh, paragraph as not very comprehensible. So very low numbers, let's say on a scale of one to 10, they say, well, this is a three. I have no idea what they're talking about, right? And then maybe not too surprisingly, when their memory was tested for it, their memory was also rather low. That is, we have a hard time remembering things when not necessarily that we don't understand it, but that we we can't put it in the context of what it's all about, right? We're not activating, there's not a schema being activated here. It turns out, and this is my favorite part of the experiment, that another group of participants got the same thing, but they got two more words added, and that was basically the title. So they were given a title. And it turns out with just a two word title, all of a sudden, this becomes very comprehensible. The number goes up from three, the other uh, group rates it as like a, an eight to so seven or eight as being able to understand it. And their memory goes up as well for it. Again, given the same amount of time, same amount of everything. So I know you wanna know what the title is. The two word title here is doing laundry. So if you're in the group that's told doing laundry first, and then you read this and you're like, wait, the procedure is quite simple. Okay, so they're talking about laundry. Now you already know, <laughs> right, about laundry and how to do it. So now you activate your schema and you about laundry and, and everything kind of fits into place. Arrange the items into groups. Okay, they're talking about the clothes, washing um, clothes, uh, separately if they're uh, dark colored versus maybe bleaching lighter colored clothes, okay, right? Um, that's what it says, 
one pile might be enough, depending on how much there is to do. So if you don't have a lot, you know, maybe just throw them all in. Anyway, as you kind of go through it, you start to see, all right, now this actually makes sense. It's not the most direct way to word it, but everything fits into place now. You make sense of it. And then of course your memory for it goes up as well. Now, why this is important, this um, schema activation is you can, I, I tend to think about this, especially in teaching and learning that many times if the schema is not activated for students, that this is kind of how what we're saying comes across to them, right? How, how a faculty or teacher might, a uh, professor might sound where they're like, procedures, like, what are they talking about? What are they talking about, right? Uh, but having that schema activated, then all of a sudden you get it and make sense and you can take in more information, right? Because you can fit it with what you already know or see if it uh, contradicts what you already know as well, which can also help your, your memory too. So very simple things in this case, just kind of knowing a little bit more what is enough to really boost your, your uh, memory and comprehension of it. And so these are kind of simple, this is in particular is a pretty simple thing that educators can do to help students to learn that it's just a little bit more information about what it is, activate what they already know, which then they can take in new information and kind of fit it into their uh, existing schemas or, or challenge their existing schemas, right? This is a different way of doing uh, laundry or a different thing that you haven't heard before, but blend it with something you already know. Uh, another technique that's often used that fits what we're saying about how memory works with connections are what we call mnemonic devices. So mnemonic devices by definition are kind of techniques. They organize, they help us organize materials. So thinking back to that library, our card catalog there, right? They kind of provide that organization and they can often then appear to improve memory. And I put improve or improving in quotes because it's not really that your memory is being improved, right? In the sense, you're just making a better use of what memory is already doing. So you're providing that organization that's helpful for memory I wouldn't say you're improving, you're just doing it, making a good use of it, right? So these mnemonic devices, there's different types. I'm gonna show you a few, or two types here. The first is um, what's called the method of low side. It depends on locations. And so I wanna tell you that all these mnemonic devices really do, uh, they're helpful because they do three things. They give us that structure. They allow for a, a record or a memory to be distinctive and last long, that durability. And then ultimately the very important part is memory is really all about being able to retrieve information. So they give us those cues for recall. So what we're really doing is using cues that can help launch that memory that we're looking for, help get us to it. So looking at the method of loci, I know it can seem a little complicated, I was going to tell you that a lot of this you do in advance, and so you would already have it, and then you can add new things that you want to remember. So the set of loci is supposed to be an area or locations. Loci is like a location that you're already familiar with. So this is one person's particular house. If you didn't have all this in your house, if you don't have a coat closet right, um, or a fireplace, then you wouldn't want to use that. You'd want to take that out and replace it with something you do. I try to view this as kind of like, what happens when you mentally, you know, mentally walk into your home? What's the first thing you see? For them, it was the driveway. Makes sense, right? Um, then they go in through the garage door. But if you don't, you, you could you know, put it where you go in. So you're kind of using what you already do so that the set of loci is, should not be complicated for you. It should be your normal sort of routine or normal things you're used to. So you don't really have to remember that. That's the important part. What we do wanna remember is this list of words. And so this is the information we want to put into our memory. It looks a lot like a grocery list, right? So this is their grocery list. They want some grapefruit and tomatoes, et cetera. Now, how are they going to remember that without putting it into their phone? <laughs> right? uh, they, they lost their phone, so they're, they're stuck. They got to remember these things. So they're using imagery here along with the location. So we have our driveway. They 
that's the first thing they see. So again, they, they're like driveway is the first place in my house that I, uh, when I enter and I want to remember grapefruit. So I'm going to imagine that there is grapefruit instead of rocks along um, the, the driveway, right? So they, they do that in advance. So they have to imagine uh, those, those grapefruits there as rocks in their driveway, which prov imagery provides uh, that distinctive record. And if you go through, you can see it doesn't have to be that, but that's just what made sense for them to do to kind of have it stick out. And then their garage door, they wanted to remember tomatoes. So they imagined someone throwing tomatoes or tomatoes splattered on the garage door and kind of so on and so forth. There's a couple of things here. One is since you come up with all these essentially on your own, as far as the images and how you do it, you're spending um, time. But when you're doing that, you're thinking about, okay, how do I put this together? And that act of thinking about it, we already saw helps, right? Kind of, okay, what am I gonna put here and why? So there's usually some reasoning behind it, even if it's just for fun and be like, oh, it'd be fun to have, think of grapefruits as rocks. But even just thinking that increases your memory of it immediately. And then what the set of loci does is give you those cues. So now I just have to, when I'm at the grocery store, travel in my mind in my house and think, okay, I'm in my driveway, what's there? Oh, right, grapefruits, and I can see it. So that's a fun one, especially if you get used to using it. Um, a lot of people really like that one and it is very powerful to help help remember. Another one you I uh, think is a little bit more popular, there we go, is what's called the first letter mnemonic. So the first letter mnemonic is exactly how it sounds. It takes the first letter of a list of things or uh, that you're trying to remember and then you try to make a phrase or an acronym from it. So for instance, Roy G. Biv is the colors of the rainbow. That would be kind of a person's name, like if their name was Roy, middle name B, last name Biv. Yeah, <laughs> it just is a little catchy. And then that can help you remember that it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, I know is a very popular one for mathematics. It's the orders of operation. And so it's parentheses, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. But it's hard to remember that, right? It's hard to remember, like, what do I do first and why? It's much easier to remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, and then kind of go back and say, all right, which one of these is the E? Which one of these is the M, et cetera? So these work, like I said, because they give you that structure and they're particularly helpful for recall. Uh, there are some disadvantages for just strictly relying on mnemonics though, which is that they tend not to go much further. So for instance, um, you know, here's another way of saying it. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is great for telling you the order of operations, but it doesn't actually tell you how to multiply or how to divide or how to write out or subtract. So if if you're asked to do that, this isn't going to help you with that, right? But it is, it's a good starting point. So they're usually helpful for lists or things that don't have much organization or order to themselves for you to put that order on them in a sentence um, or acronym type thing. Okay, so we're saying before that the, that we see through these experiments that memory appears to depend on connections, particularly when we uh, think about connections or think about these memories together that we essentially build connections between them. But is that the only place that they come from? Or another way of saying it is, is there a limit? What else matters for forming these memory connections? And it turns out it's actually much stronger than um, what you think about matters, but there's Turns out that your memory will pretty much encode anything going on around you, including your own emotional state, uh, biological states, whether you're hungry or not, right? Being tired or not, <laughs> and emotional, being angry or not, right? Scared, nervous, all those things. Um, and what you're thinking about, even your physical location where you're at appears to be um, encoded into memory as well. So yes, the contents, what I was saying is it's not just the contents that get in there, but other things that are going on at the time, including what you're thinking about, how you feel, etc. Now this is a little surprising 
because, and I'm going to show you that how far we can kind of go with this, but um, it's almost like why isn't, why aren't our memory systems more specific, right? Why are they encoding, trying to encode pretty much everything? And I would think probably the answer to that, nobody knows for sure, is that you don't always know in advance what you want to remember, right? As in if something is happening, it's not really clear what parts are going to be important, what parts aren't. So it's kind of a safe bet to encode everything and then later try to sort through what you want to rehearse, what mattered and what didn't matter. But in general, at least everything is available as a memory cue. So let's see how strong this is. This is another good experiment. So this is called state dependent learning. It's this learning that's dependent on what's going on around you or how you, how you think, how you feel, et cetera. In this case, they, and this experiment, they varied the location to see if different locations would matter. And again, they wanted to kind of go extreme with locations to see if they could, you know, get an effect here. I'm gonna show you later that you don't actually have to go this extreme, but it made sense for them to start this way. So they took uh, people who were scuba divers and they gave them a list of words to remember. And you could do this either visually or auditorily, sort of say the words out loud and of course you have to remember them later. In this case, um, they did it auditorily. So they took people and, and sometimes they gave them the, what's called the learn well condition. So this list of words they had to remember, they were told it while they sat, what we call poolside. <laughs> so that's what we call on land. So they sat by the pool, not in it, but by it. And they were told this information. Other group of people were told this information under the water, meaning they went scuba diving and they had the headset. And so on the headset, they person would read out the words that they had to remember. Right? Now imagine what that's like for a moment. Obviously you have to be a good scuba diver in order to you know, be willing to do this. But when you're hearing those words, the real question is, are, is your memory encoding more than just the words? So are you encoding the fact that what the watery world looks like, uh, the sound of your regulator, um, all, you know, all those kind of things. And if so, would that then help you to be back in that environment when you were tested? So that's ultimately what they're looking at. Is there an advantage to matching how you learn to how you test in, in this case in your actual environment? So you can see they took four groups, two of them matched. So they learned sitting poolside and then they recalled sitting poolside as well. So it was kind of an on, you know, on land, on land match. Uh, they also had an underwater, underwater match. So people went down, learned underwater and then went back down and were asked to say those words, that is recall those words, right? And then we have two groups that they're in the mismatch group. They learned either on water or on land and then were placed in the opposite condition and asked to, to recall. So having all four of these groups, we can then see which groups do the best and whether this fits the idea of matching or, or, or learning depending on where we're at and what's going on around us. All right, so no big surprise here. <laughs> it turns out, yes, we, that the groups that had the matched conditions did the best. So I wanted to point out something here because often this part gets um, a little confused or a little confusing, which is, we're not saying that, um, for instance, that learning underwater is the best way to learn, right? It turns out it's not, and that's not too surprising. Turns out if you look at the best way, the group that did the best was our on land, on land group. And so they ended up with a long list of words, hard to remember words for, you know, kind of no reason. So they ended up with about 37, 38% correct. And that's our highest group, right? So that's our best group from this long list of words and they are a match group. So if you really wanna do the best, on land, on land is the way to go. But that's not really what we're looking at here. What we're looking at here is 
what are the, do the matches do better than the mismatches? And it turns out the second best is also a match. And that's the important part. So learning underwater and going back underwater is our second best group. And they're also a match. So in general, these match groups did much better than the mismatched groups. And that's really the important part. So it shows us that going back to the conditions under which we learned gives us a boost in our memory compared to when we don't match them, right? Those are our, our worst groups in a sense. So for the best learning, you really would want to match the environment to that you learned in to the one that you uh, want to remember it in or recall in. And we do see this in real life a lot. I'll give you an example. Uh, we talk about, yeah, I'll put them both up here. Uh, what we call context reinstatement or bringing back the conditions or context under which we learn something. So if you are last remember something, so if you lose your keys, you often are told to go think about the last place you had them. That kind of puts you back in that mindset, right? It also kind of helps potentially eliminate places that it's not, but it's also kind of to rewind and, and think about it again. Uh, People who witness crimes are often asked to, in some cases, physically go back to the scene of the crime in which they might then remember something that they had forgotten, right? With the context of being back at the place, reminding them, right? It's almost like the place holds the memories, but not really, it's just they see something else that provides a cue and they're like, oh, that's right. That's what happened when I was here, okay. that. The, you know, the book over there reminded me. So it can be these strange things that remind them, but there's a lot of cues in that actual location. And I think people have experienced this if you ever go back to a place you haven't been in a very long time, uh, but we're really familiar with at one point in time. So for instance, like going back to your old high school, you usually people talk about like a flood of memories or other these things they haven't thought about in forever coming back. And that's because again, there's so many cues in the environment from these connections to help remind us. So what this tells us is that we're not just encoding what's happening, but we're coding these other things, these outside things like the sound of your regulator, right? Um, a book being somewhere. And it's hard to know which things will, will trigger the memory and which ones won't, but if put back in those conditions, there's enough cues to bring back those memories. Not surprising then, this is a rather strong effect in memory to see these uh, matches. So we're gonna talk about what that means for trying to um, learn. And then remember, the first thing I did wanna bring up because I think it's important is that these are all arguing that you have to go back to the physical location. And this was tested to see, can you, do you have to actually go back or can you just, mentally go back, like, you know, travel in your mind. So in this case, asking people to remember what something felt like, you, know, you think of a, um, I think of the, the crime situation where maybe you can't go back to the crime scene or you don't want to, but if they ask you, can you remember, you know, think about being there. What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What's going on? It turns out that doing that is actually the same thing. So you don't really have to physically go back. You just have to kind of put yourself back in that mindset where you really try to uh, remember what happened you know, what things felt like. And so you do get a context reinstatement. They did this with students who just switched rooms that they would learn in and then be tested, but it turns out it works across the board. So you don't have to actually go back. You can just think about it. And that in itself will bring back that, that context here. All right, so what does this mean? Uh, essentially, it means in some ways that we really do want to either, well, first of all, let's say we want to match how we learn with how we recall. Or another way, probably of saying this, is that we don't really want to mismatch them, right? If you have a mismatch, that's going to be problematic. Those are the two groups that did not do as well as the matched groups. So however you want to think about it, class half full, glass half empty, I tend to think about it as the mismatches are probably the ones that stick out as being detrimental. So for instance, um, we can look at conditions under which people usually study and then the conditions under which they're tested. And so 
a typical, my cat here, it's not really my cat, but <laughs> pretend cat here looks very comfortable. He's very calm. Uh, this may be what some students, maybe a lot of them try to do when studying, right? They might have music on in the background. They might be calm, uh, relaxed, right? And then they go to take the test. And it is a totally different world than in which they did most of their studying. And so this is problematic because they're, they're basically creating a big mismatch for the calm factor. <clears throat> the anxiety is a huge factor, uh, so much so that it can even cause what people say, I couldn't remember anything, sort of a block, a memory block. And really what the block is, is that it's so vastly different than how you learned it. So if you learned it when you were calm and you're asked to remember it and now you're nervous and especially extremely nervous, it's likely that you will not be able to remember much at all, even though, yes, in fact, you do know it, right? That's what it's, I do know it. It's like, yes, but it's just the match isn't there. It's too, it's too extreme, <clears throat> particularly with the emotional um, anxiety there too. So what this tells us then is that we might not always be doing the best matching. And yes, I guess you would so say, well, should I make myself more nervous when I study? Um, in a sense, yes. And you could do that through other means, like you know, some caffeine would increase heart rate, which is the same as similar to being nervous. Uh, so that's one way is to, to make it make sure that you're not always comfortable, make sure you're not always listening to music or calm when you're studying. But another way of saying this is that if you vary it enough that you won't become locked in to any particular context in the first place. So as the saying, just don't have your memories be so strongly context dependent. And the only way to really do that is to study or learn under a wide variety of circumstances and places and times. And if you can do that, then they don't become locked in to what, remember our scuba divers only heard that list of words once and it was only either on land or on water. They didn't later go and study at the library and then study somewhere, right? So they didn't have that and that's why that effect was so strong for them it is a strong but if we really want to be able to recall things across uh, a different circumstance then we have to really study or think about them under different circumstances as well including sometimes when we're calm sometimes when we're not sometimes when we're comfortable sometimes when we're not right and then they won't become uh, locked into any of those parameters which is kind of the best way right you want to be prepared in a sense no matter what Kind of one way of looking at that. All right, and that does bring me good time. I'm just looking at my time. That does bring me to end here, which is, um, like I said, our brief overview of everything memory, not quite everything memory, does kind of point out a few things that we can use as, as take home messages for, um, for learning and how memory works. And the biggest uh, three here that I summarize would be back from our penny experiment that's sort of simply hearing or seeing something is zero guarantee that you're actually going to learn it or remember it and that's regardless of how many times one sees or hears it, it it's not going to matter if you're not actively making sense of it thinking about the meaning and comparing it to or connecting it to other things that you know so that step is way more important than simple exposure to it right and then the other one is that we uh, rely on our previous knowledge or our schemas here to really make sense of information that's coming in. And so anytime we can activate a schema or help someone, let someone know what the schema is that's being activated before bringing in new information, that helps as well for them to not only understand, but also to remember in the long run too. All right, thank you. Last one there. All righty, thank you, Dr. Daniels. Um, doesn't look like we've had any questions come in. So as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and submit those down into the Q&A so that they can be addressed. Um, in the meantime, if you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our learning and growing, webinar series, 
please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm going to link in the chat in just one second. We'll also be emailing you a link to view the recording of this webinar once it's available. So we'll hang out maybe for like another minute if you have time, Dr. Daniels, just yeah. to see if any questions come in. But if not, um, then that wraps it up for today. I'm trying to directly see the chat. I can't, I can see something there. Let me see. Okay. All right. Now I can see it. So. You got it. Okay. Good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. We did, um, Dr. Daniels, have one question come in. Okay. Um, the question is Does a student's use of the schemas? Sorry, <laughs> depend on prior knowledge of course content. Uh, yes, I mean, in a sense, I would say pretty much it's going to, it's one of these things. Well, so there's kind of an irony in memory. It's just like a kind of cruel irony, which is Essentially, the more you know about something, the easier it is to take in any new information about it. And so it's kind of a somewhat unfair, right? But, but in a sense, it shows that if you learn more than any new information about that comes in much, much more easier and is much easier to remember because you have a much bigger understanding and schema of it built up. So having that any prior knowledge is going to absolutely help um, it's going to help build to the schema and what they, you know, what they already know makes that new information that much easier to comprehend and understand for sure. If we have any other questions for Dr. Daniels, go ahead and put them in the Q&A now. Otherwise, we will wrap up shortly. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, Dr. Daniel. So that will wrap it up for the day in today's webinar. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Dr. Daniels. I hope thank everyone you. has a great rest of the day. Thank you.